Good afternoon. India is the world's largest democracy, but it's also one of the most diverse countries. We have on our currency note, if you see, the value given in 17 languages. So in addition to Hindi, which is the official language of the Union, and English, which is the associate official language, we have the value given in Assamese, Bengali, Gujarati, Kannada, Konkani, Kashmiri, Marathi, Malayalam, Odia, Nepali, Telugu, Sanskrit, and so many other languages. But that's not all. In addition to these languages which you see on the, on the currency note, we also have languages in the 8th schedule. These are languages like Bodo, Dogri, Santhali, Sindhi, Maithili, and Manipuri. And we have six classical languages in the country. Classical languages are those which have a script and which are more than a thousand years old. So you have Kannada, Telugu, Tamil, Sanskrit, and Uriya. And then the People's Linguistic Survey of India tells us that there are another 784 bolis in the country, which are spoken by more than a thousand people. And if you were to include languages which are spoken by less than a thousand people, you could add a few more thousands to the linguistic diversity of this country. But this linguistic diversity of a country has been our strength. The national movement was not carried out in English. The national movement became a national movement when the Congress realized after Mahatma Gandhi came back from South Africa that the organization of the Congress has to be on linguistic lines. So we had the Uriya Congress, the Sindh Congress, the Kannada Congress, the Bangla Congress, long before the states were organized into linguistic provinces. So we've had the first reorganization of the country on linguistic lines during the freedom movement itself. Now, after the freedom movement, we've had four great leaders telling us about how the country ought to be run. You know, Mahatma Gandhi written a book called Hind Swaraj. So he conceptualized India as a set of village republics. Dr. Ambedkar was totally opposed to it because he felt that villages will be the dens of casteism and the dominant castes will not allow democracy to flourish. Sadhar Patel felt that you need a strong civil service. He felt that we must retain the ICS. That's the sin qua non of administration. Nehru said that it's neither Indian nor civil nor a service. But they disagreed on everything, but they agreed that India has to be reorganized on linguistic lines because that was an article of faith. And yet, you see, what happened was that when India became free in 1947, this is the formation of India at that time. And mind you, none of the territories or states that's represented here is as it is today. You see Mysuru here, but Mysuru today is Karnataka. You see Hyderabad here, but that's different. So the first reorganization of the country that had to take place on linguistic lines could not take place on linguistic lines because of the partition that took place in the country. And you are aware that there were 500 to 800,000 deaths, millions of displacements, and therefore this went to the back burner. And we got the first map of India, uh, which had the organization, we were able to reorganize the 562 princely states, we merged them with the neighboring provinces, but did not do it on linguistic lines. That did not mean that this demand uh, was, was rejected, it remained dormant. And what happened was that in 1952, when the chief minister of the then Madras state, C. Rajagopalachari, tried to divert the waters of the Krishna River from the Telugu-speaking areas 
to the Tamil speaking areas, all hell broke loose. And Telugus felt that not only have they been denied their state, their natural resources are also being diverted. And therefore there was an agitation. Poti Siramalu died and Andhra state was announced. Now remember, this Andhra state only had the Telugu speaking areas of erstwhile Madras. But a lot of Telugu speaking areas were in Hyderabad, which was a multilingual state. It had Kannada speaking people, it had Marathi speaking people, and it had a lot of Urdu speaking people. Therefore, the first reorganization of the map of India came about because of an agitation. But immediately after the agitation, it was also felt that let us set up a state's reorganization commission so that all the demands for new states can come up before that commission. Now this commission uh, went around the country. They received 1.5 lakh memoranda. 1.5 lakh memoranda. And wherever they went, they were greeted with processions. Some said, we would like to retain the boundaries of the state. Others said, no, bifurcate the state. We want a new state. So, but they came out with a set of recommendations which had India organized into 14 states and six union territories. This is how India looked like after 1956 when the states were reorganized on the basis of the, of the States Reorganization Commission. What is notable here is that while the southern states, all the four southern states, each of the four southern languages got a state for their own, for their own language, Kerala for the Malayalam speakers, Madras for speakers of Tamil language, Andhra Pradesh for the Telugus, and of course, it was still called Mysore for the Kannada speaking people. Dr. Ambedkar called it the balkanization of the South and the consolidation of the North because many states were not reorganized, especially Bombay, Punjab, and Assam, because in those days in the 50s, till the BSF was set up, the defense, the first line of defense of the international border was the state police. And it was felt that states had to be really large, they had to be administratively viable, financially strong, to be able to maintain an armed police against the bordering on, on the frontier areas. But the recommendations of the SRC were tweaked over a period of time. And today, as you are aware, we are 28 states and nine union territories. So let me take you through that story. This is the first agitation took place in, in 1960, when Bombay was reorganized into Maharashtra and Gujarat. Now, there were very strong sentiments of the Gujaratis and the Marathas wanting the reorganization of their state. So, the state was reorganized, but the principle of SRC was somehow breached. Another very important thing happened, and that was the creation of Nagaland in 1963, with a population of just 3 lakhs. But that was a concession which was made to an ethnic group which agreed to give up violence. But when Nagaland was made, on that day itself, Mizoram had been made, Meghalaya had been made, Arunachal had been made, because the principle had been breached even further. 1965, the border security was created, border security force was created on 1st December 1965. And after the BSF had been made, the logic of not giving Punjabi Suba to Punjab, that logic did not did not work. So you had Punjab and Haryana and Himachal Pradesh and Chandigarh all come up. So what is happening is that new states and new union territories are coming out because of specific incidents. It is not a well-planned strategy that, and we have not been able to understand what are the long-term implications when we reorganize the states in a piecemeal manner. From 68, to 88, all of the Northeast was reorganized first into Union territories and then into the seven states. In 1975, Sikkim chose to be a part of our country. I say this because the majority citizens of Sikkim felt that there would be greater democracy 
and adult suffrage in India, which they were not getting under the Chogyal regime. Move to 2000. After a series of long agitations, Uttarakhand, Charkhand, and Chhattisgarh were created. Right. And then, in 2014, we had yet another thing that came up, which was the state of Telangana. Now, Telangana came up after a long agitation, and that agitation was a bit interesting because it was on the issue of development. It was no longer on the issue of language. The final reorganization that we've seen is that of Jammu and Kashmir, which was to fulfill the electoral promise of abolition of 370. So when 370 was abolished, Jammu Kashmir was reorganized into the Union Territory of Ladakh and the Union Territory of Jammu and Kashmir. Incidentally, friends, Jammu and Kashmir before 1947 was called Jammu wa Kashmir wa Ladakh wa Tibbatha. It had imagined itself as a confederation of four states. Be that as it may, the question that comes up before us is that have things changed from 1956 to now? When the first SRC was made, our population was 40 crores. Today our population is 142 crores. The asymmetry among the states has grown. UP has a population of 24 crores, followed by Maharashtra with a population of 13 crores, Bihar with a population of 13 crores. The largest state in the south, Tamil Nadu, has a population of 7.5 crores. If you put Andhra and Telangana together, the Telugu-speaking population would be about 8.2 crores. But then you have Sikkim with a population of just about 7 lakhs. So what does it tell us about the symmetry and asymmetry within the nation? And this is going to grow and it's going to become more intense as we head for the next delimitation in which the parliamentary constituencies will be reorganized in the year 2026. So, the issue is that are we going to react to every agitation? Or are we going to be thinking ahead of the future and look at the reorganization of the states of India based on empirical evidence? And that's where the logic of a permanent or a second states reorganization commission comes. And there are five reasons for this. First is that immediately after the creation of Telangana, the argument that a non-Hindi speaking state, a non-Hindi speaking area can have only one state, that is no longer valid. So you can have a Vidarbha and Maharashtra, you can have a very large state, can Bengal, can have Bengal and North Bengal. In Bengal, there are there's a demand for many more states. Now, this is one aspect. The second aspect is that there are several state assemblies which already have resolutions asking for their reorganization. UP, for example, has an assembly resolution which says that UP should be reorganized into Avadh, Bundelkhand, Paschim Pradesh, and Purvanchal. Incidentally, many decades ago, the assemblies of Bengal and Bihar wanted to merge the state, but the union government did not agree to that. Because the territories of India are defined by Schedule 1, Article 1, whereas those of the states are covered under Article 2 and Article 3 of the Constitution. Third reason is that we have very, very large metros. I mean, Bengaluru, Hyderabad, Kolkata, Mumbai. These are no longer based just on language of the state in which they are located. Kolkata, for example, is not just a Bengali city. Bombay or Mumbai is no longer meant only for the Marathi Manus. In Bangalore, you find, we find that there are people from all over the country. Now, are these large metros going to belong to the state in which they are? Or should they be treated as national regions where everyone in the country has a right to come, become an entrepreneur, earn his livelihood, and create greater development? Fourth point. Are we going to look 
at the the Lok Sabha, of course, has to be based on the strength of numbers. But can we look at the Rajya Sabha a bit differently? And if you recall, last point is that if we look into the Bhagavad Gita, the first few shlokas are a dialogue between Sanjay and Dhritarashtra in which they are discussing which are the armies on the side of the Kauravas and which are the side armies on the side of the Pandavas. And you, you get a recall of about you get a recall of scores of Indian Janapadas, Indian kingdoms, from Gandhar to the Malaya kingdom. So can we look at reorganizing ourselves on the lines that existed in Bharat a long time ago? Friends, Bharat is Akshar. That is, Bharat will always be. It is permanent. But the constituents of Bharat are Akshar, which is perishable. They can be altered, territories can be added, territories can be changed, and configurations can be shaped to take into account demographics, migration, and aspirations. As Bharat enters the Amrut Kal, we have to look ahead. We have to think for the next century, for the next millennia, and also have our ear to the ground. It's time we reorganized the internal boundaries of a country. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.